Welcome to Netcast Home. Wherever you're taking in this content, on a computer screen, TV, tablet, phone, whatever it is, we just want to say welcome. We know the world is crazy and has changed so much over the last week, and we just want to sit here together and celebrate the one thing that has not changed, which is God and His love for people. Here in Netcast Home, we want to create a digital platform where Jesus can be made known and Christ can be exalted. And then we also want to connect people into the church because we say all the time in NetCast, the church is a people, not a place. Now more than ever, we need to lean into that and be reminded that God is still at work even when we don't see it. This is going to be our norm over the next couple of weeks. We'll send out weekly gatherings just like this, weekly worship times just like this, along with some daily connective content. So stay up to date with us on YouTube, emails, social media, and we'll have more information on that to follow. Over the next few minutes, we're going to lead you in a time of worship and prayer and reflection and teaching, and we invite you wherever you are. Just sit back, relax, breathe, and get ready to celebrate the goodness of God with us. We're going to start this morning with a message from Pastor Matt. We're beginning a brand new series called Christ Over COVID. Enjoy. More deaths, more cases as thousands of Americans begin to self-quarantine. It poses a greater global threat than terrorism. Now here in New York City, a state of emergency declared as well. The turmoil on Wall Street amid the coronavirus outbreak. There's no treatment known, there's no vaccine. This says New York bans all gatherings of 500 people. Panic is rippling through the global stock market. More than 10,000 school closures nationwide. Shops, cafes, restaurants, bars, all forced to close. And rising fear. Officially a global pandemic. All games for all teams suspended until further notice. It is dead. How you doing, everybody? My name is Matt Chuney. I'm the lead pastor over here at Netcast Church. And um, man, if, if if you've not been in a cave over the last few weeks, right, uh, you are very well aware that there is a lot going on in our society right now. We have a, a virus that is spreading around the globe like crazy. Um, hundreds of thousands of people have been infected by it. And uh, man, it just seems like we are in a time of chaos right now, right? Mm-hmm. President Trump recently has just uh, stated that we are in a national state of emergency. Our governor recently has just uh, said that we can't gather in settings that are more than 25 people. Schools are closing, kids are homes. And, uh, and, and the craziest thing of all is, right, none of us have toilet paper. So uh, it's just a weird, weird time. Uh, in some ways, though, if we're honest, as I'm watching Watching the news and following this like everybody else is, it does feel like we are shutting down as a globe, right? It seems like the entire world seems to be on pause. And um, while everyone seems to be running around like pre- preparing for isolation or uh, social distancing, what, what I wanted to make sure that we're doing as a church is making sure that the church is prepared. Yeah. We need to be prepared spiritually, right? We need to be prepared as followers of Jesus. And, uh, and, and right Right now, everyone seems to be a little on edge, which is natural, right? There are times in our lives where we're going to be on edge. But uh, Proverbs 12, verse 25 reminds us again that anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word 
makes them glad. Mm-hmm. And so what I want to do today is I kind of want to just bring us a good word, some good news, right? We, we need to be reminded of some good news in the midst of all this uncertainty. And, and to do that, what I want to talk to us today a little bit about is, is who's in charge. Like who is the ultimate authority? Who is the authoritative figure over all of this? And um, right now, if we're honest, we are watching something that we have never seen before. We are watching people in authority flexing their power at every turn. And and for me, that at times is frustrating, but it also has been beautiful to see. Uh, the frustrating thing about it all is, I, I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I don't like being told what to do all the time. I don't like being told, right, when and when when we can meet as a church and when we can't meet. I don't like being told I have to stay home. I'm an extrovert, right? I want to be out and about with my friends and my family. I don't like being told when I go to Target how many how, how many uh, Purell bottles I can get or how many rolls of toilet paper I'm about to ha- I'm allowed to have. They're telling me just one, just one, just one. And 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 I just don't like being told what to do. So if you're anything like me, you feel my pain. But in the middle of all of this. There's also a lot of beauty that I'm seeing. Uh, It's rare to see uh, authoritative figures making decisions for the good of the people. I I mean, honestly, I'm beginning to get the vibe as I'm listening to all of the things go down and all the changes that are being made. It seems as if our authoritative figures that exist in our world, they seem to be making decisions based upon preserving lives, people's health people's safety, which is far different than I normally feel when I'm watching authoritative figures make decisions, right? Normally, I find myself feeling like people are trying to flex their authority in order to protect their image, in order to protect themselves, in order to make themselves become even more powerful or gain more money or have more influence. But I mean, during all of this, I'm just not getting that vibe. I mean, we are watch- we're watching companies organizations, we're watching individuals make decisions that is forcing them to sacrifice billions and billions of dollars for the greater good. And that is absolutely incredible. But with all that being said, I want to pose this question to us. Who do you think is in charge? Who's the ultimate authority in this? In in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. In the beginning, it was God who created all things. And and at that point in time, most of the earth, right, it was chaotic. And and, and it was it, it says that it was filled without form and with void. And, and so really what it means is it was just chaos going on. But God, in the middle of that, he planted a garden and then took Adam and planted Adam in the garden and then from Adam made Eve. And so he placed two human beings that were created in his image, in his likeness, in the garden. And he tells them, listen, I'm giving you one rule to follow. Don't eat of this one tree. But other than that, I want you to grow this garden. I want you to cultivate it. I want you to expand it. I want you to take dominion over the earth. I want you to multiply and be fruitful. And and God was telling us to just go and spread his beauty and goodness throughout the earth. And, And they began to do that, right? And he gave them one rule. And that rule, I think, was given to, to, to get, be a means for which Adam and Eve can demonstrate their love for God, right? If they disobey, that means that they don't trust, they don't love. If they obey, they love and they trust. And all was going well in the beginning, right? They're, they're working together. There's, there's, they're experiencing the joy of God, the favor of God, intimacy with God, the kindness of God. There's purpose. There's health. There's no sickness, there's a peace that surpasses anything that we can understand in a, in, in a world that's full of chaos. And all seems to be well, right? There's good food. There's good music. There's good wine. There's just everything seems to be going good as creation is playing its proper part in bringing glory to God and, and joy to God's people. And that continues on until Satan shows up to deceive. And he comes in and he deceives Adam and Eve to disobey God and to sin against God. And when they do this, what happens? Sin enters the world and spreads like wildfire. So much so that in Genesis chapter 6 verse 5, it says that the Lord saw that the wickedness of, so much so that the, the Lord saw that the wickedness was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of the human heart was only 
evil continually. I mean, that's heavy stuff. That sin begins to affect everything. It becomes this massive pandemic that begins to be passed, not just throughout the globe, but from generation to generation to generation to generation. Every single human being from that point forward is infected with this disease that has has them led now with this propensity towards like selfishness and disobedience. Like, I'm just going to, I'm here to get mine and don't tell me what to do. And, and, and from there, that's where things like hatred and greed come from. You've got laziness and gluttony and alcoholism and divorce, murder, sickness. You've got pain. All of these things are beginning to enter into our world because of this thing called sin, this disease called sin. And the penalty for sin is death is what the scriptures would teach us. Meaning that when everything was created, it was created with this uh, eternal lifespan. But instead now, now everything has an expiration date. And the truth is that whether or not the coronavirus gets us or something else, we're all going to die. And and whether you want to hear this or not, the truth is, is that most of us will probably die before we thought we would. And so what does God do? God in his goodness, he puts together this grand plan, right? Where in his perfect timing, he's going to send his son, Jesus, to come to earth in the flesh to take upon himself this penalty, this death penalty for sin. And so for us now, on the other side of the cross, right, what happens is that now it doesn't need to lead to death. There's this eternal life that is in front of us. Jesus now has given us power over sin, power over death. There's this elimination of sin in the world to come where, where there is no sickness, there is no pain, there is no hurt, there is no disease. And the entire Bible points to this plan. Right, So 2,000 years ago, we see this happen. In Scripture, it teaches us that Jesus shows up on the scene, born of a virgin. At 12 years old, he's wise beyond uh, his years. At 30 years old, he begins uh, this public ministry that's geared towards loving the unlovable, being amongst the sick, caring for them, at times healing them. He's walking around bucking the religious system. He's got power above everybody else, and he's claiming to have authority far beyond anybody else's authority. He believes he has the authority to forgive sin. (laughs) In Mark chapter 2, it's the craziest story, right? There's some guy who's extremely sick. He's a paraplegic, and he's brought to Jesus uh, hoping to get physically healed. But when Jesus looks at him, the first thing he says to him is, son, your sins have been forgiven, to which everybody else is like, so what? Right? Like, who cares? My sins are free. I'm trying to be able to walk again. But Jesus had this eternal perspective. But then to prove that he has authority over sin and to forgive sin, he says, so just so you know that I have the authority to do this, why don't you do this? Pick up your bed and go home. And the dude does. And he's healed. And so this entire gospel of Mark, I want to look at it together. Because story after story after story, what you're going to find is Jesus flexing his authority over everything, Mm -hmm. which is good news for us. That's a good word for us. Because in the midst of chaos, in the midst of all the uncertainty, in the midst of this virus spreading throughout the globe, right? We're going to have this temptation of being paralyzed by fear. But what we're going to see in scripture is we do not need to walk in fear. Mm -hmm. Fear not. For I have redeemed you. I've called you by name. You belong to me. Be strong and courageous. Don't be dismayed. Don't be fearful. For the Lord your God is with you everywhere you go. And in Mark, in the book of Mark, Jesus, the Godhead, the God man is going to demonstrate that to us. And so if you got a Bible, you can turn with me. I'm going to read really all throughout different portions of scripture, but I'm going to start in Mark chapter one, starting in verse 12, where Jesus is going to show us the funniest thing ever, whereas he's not just authoritative over like us and creating, like when he goes and hangs out in the wild with the animals, even the animals obey him. I don't know if you've ever seen Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, but it's like a scene with Jim Carrey telling everybody like, hey, back off. Well, like, you're, I'm, I'm in this with you. And so in Mark chapter 1, verse 12, it says this, the spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. He was there for 40 days. And he was with them in the wild with the wild animals. And the angels were ministering to them. 
If you move forward even further, you can look at Jesus' authority again in, in, in chapter 1. Look at verse 23. It says that there he was, he was in the synagogue with a man who uh, had an unclean spirit. Here's a man who's possessed demonically, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice comes right out. You fast forward to uh, further on in that verse, in that chapter in verse 32, it says, In evening... Uh, at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out many demons. And he would not even permit the demons to speak because they knew him. I mean, Jesus is looking at an, an entire another world, right? Things from the heavenlies, things in the spiritual realm, and he's saying, you know who I am, don't talk, and they don't. Fast forward to the second portion of uh, chapter 2. You see that Jesus is flexing his authority over even the religious leaders who are walking around telling people, this is what it means to be good. This is what it means to obey God. All of these rules and regulations that these religious leaders are putting over them. Jesus uh, comes to them in, in chapter 23 and it says, on, on, on one Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. And as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath? Like, why are they doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath? And you jump down to verse 28. Jesus is just so clear. He says, the son of man, in other words, me, I'm the Lord over the Sabbath. Like every rule and regulation that you see is in place and I'm over it. Jump even further. Look to, to, to Mark chapter 4. You're going to see Jesus Again, demonstrating his authority. It's crazy here. It says he left the crowds after uh, he, he was there speaking to them. It says, and, and they took him with them in a boat. He's with his disciples. And a great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. And so there's water filling into the boat. Everybody's freaking out. But what's Jesus doing? It says in verse 38, but he was in the stern asleep on a cushion. <laughs> And they woke him up and they said to him, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Like we're about to die. Don't you care about that? And he awoke. And what does he do? He rebukes the wind. Like to this day, we have not been able to get the wind to do what we want the wind to do. He rebukes the wind and says to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased. And there was a great calm. The authority of Jesus is unmatched. Move further. Move to uh, Mark chapter 7. At the end of Mark chapter 7, Jesus comes upon a man who's mute. He's deaf and he cannot speak. And this, this is wild to watch what Jesus does here. It's absolutely crazy. It says they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they began to, uh, and, and they begged him to lay his hands on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, watch what Jesus does. He put his finger into his ears. My man gets a wet willy from Jesus. I mean, that's crazy. And after spitting, he touched his tongue. Now, I'm not recommending you do any of this, okay? I, I know some of y'all, you're watching this right now. You're like, hey, I got a plan. Here's how we heal, heal corona, right? Oh, yeah. No, don't do any of those things, okay? Please, okay? From, from your pastor, no. Wash your hands, sanitize. This is Jesus. But what happens? And then Jesus looked up to the heaven and he sighed and says to him, be open. And his ears are open and his tongue was released and he spoke plainly. It's unbelievable. Not only does Jesus have, have authority over all the things that are going on around him and over sickness and over the demonic and over the animals and over the wind and the seas, he even is going to communicate. He knows what's going to happen in his future death. He says in Mark chapter 8, verse 31, he began to teach his disciples that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. 
And after three days, though, he would rise again. And he tried to say this plainly, it says. It wasn't like they understood it because he had to tell it to them multiple times. Later on in Mark chapter 10, not only does he tell them that he's going to die, but now he gives them the order of his death. It's crazy. Like, it'd be one thing to be able to say to people, hey, listen, I know cancer's going to take me out. Like, I, I just know that. It's another thing to be able to walk people through the absolute little minutia of exactly how this ordeal is going to go down. But he does this. It says in, in, in chapter 10, verse uh, 32, it says, uh, And talking with the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him. He says, See, we're going to go up to Jerusalem, and then the Son of Man's going to be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they're going to condemn him to death, but they're then going to deliver him over to the Gentiles, which were the Romans, Pilate. And they will mock him, and they will spit on him. All these things are true. They will flog him, and they will kill him. And after three days, though, he's going to rise, which is exactly what happens. Mark chapter 11, I think this is so interesting. The whole community sees that Jesus walking into, uh, walking with an authority that nobody else understands. He's walking with authority, demonstrating, claiming to have authority over everything. And so these religious elite come to him and they're like, they want to challenge him. They want to test him. And so they come to him as he was walking in the temple one day and the chief priests and the scribes and the elders who would eventually be the ones who would kill him. They said to him this, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? And Jesus flips it on him. He wants to remind them who's truly in authority. And he says, how about this? I'll ask you one question and you answer me. And I will tell you by what authority I do these things. If you could answer this, I'll give you an answer. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And then he says, answer me. In other words, you, you thought you were in authority. You want me to answer you? No, no, no. You answer to me. And they discussed it with one another saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But shall we say from man, they were afraid of the people for they all held that John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus saying, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, well, then neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Jesus is demonstrating he's got an authority. Later on in, in, in John chapter 19, uh, Jesus is having a conversation with Pilate after he's been handed over, after he's been flogged. And he's standing before Pilate, who's probably just a couple seats away from having the highest authority on the globe at that time. And he's having a conversation with Pilate, and he's explaining to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. I come from a higher place. My kingdom is, is, is much different than this. If in an instant I wanted to call legions of angels to come and release me, they would. He says to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Interesting that Jesus answers to nobody. So Pilate says to him, you're not going to speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answers him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given from you above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. What Jesus says in John chapter 10, he said, he's like, listen, I have the authority to lay my life down and I have my, the authority to lift it back up. Nobody has the authority to kill me. I lay my life down on my own accord and I will raise it again. And that's exactly what he does. Again, demonstrating that in the book of Mark, you see this in Mark chapter 16, right? After Jesus has been crucified, after Jesus has been buried, he's left in a tomb for three days. The, uh, the, his followers, his disciples are, are, don't know what to do. So they go to visit his grave site and going to his grave site. They want to see him, but they don't know how they're going to get into the cave because it's been sealed with a boulder. But when they get there, the boulders removed and they walk in and it says in Mark chapter 16, verse five, and entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. 
but go tell his disciples and Peter that he that he is going before you to Galilee there you will see him just as he's already told you and they do and he's there and he spends time with them he spends 40 days on the earth with them and before he gathers them together before he ascends rather to the heavens again he gathers them together one last time and 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 he's and and, and they're they're probably super confused and don't know what's what's going to happen next and Jesus gathers them and his last words before he actually ascends to heaven and leaves them finally is this all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me all authority in the heavens and on the earth has been given to me. It links all the way back to Genesis chapter one, right? Where it says God created the heavens and the earth. And Jesus is saying all, all authority in the heavens and the earth have been given to me. All of it. How can he make such a claim? He can make such a claim because he has all authority. He can make such a claim because he's demonstrated all authority. He can make such a claim because he came and lived a life that we couldn't, died in our place, and then rose in victory over Satan, sin, and death, releasing us from the curse of sin and now granting us the keys to the kingdom where there is now no longer the power of sin and death over us because he has all authority in heaven and on earth. That word all means all. It means everything. It's, it means no one else has any of it, right? If he's got all of it, nobody else has any of it. His claim to have all authority is phenomenal. It's the final say-so. It's the final stamp, right? Like all authority in heaven and earth belong to him, that he is the sovereign ruler over everything that is happening. All the craziness in the past that we've been seeing, all the craziness in the present moment, all the changes that are happening because of the chaos around us, all authority in the heavenlies and on earth belong to him still. He has not come off his throne. He did not lose control. He is doing something good. Even if we can't see it, even if we don't understand it, we can have trust because he is who he claims to be and he's demonstrated through his resurrection that all authority in heaven and in earth belong to him. That is a beautiful reminder for us in these days. That is a promise that, that he's good and he's glorious and he's amazing and all authority is in his hands. That's why when he walked the earth that he can make statements like, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Before he leaves, he says, peace I leave to you. My peace I give to you. This is why the psalmist, David, can make a claim like this. When I'm afraid, I put my trust in the Lord. This is why Peter can say, after walking with Jesus on the earth, he, he could say after his resurrection and his ascension, he could say, listen, cast all of your anxieties on him. Why? Because he cares for you. That's why Peter can make a claim like he did in Philippians where he says, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious about anything. You anxious right now? Anxious about a virus? You're anxious around your finances? You're anxious around the kids running around the house and they're acting crazy and you feel like you've lost full control? You're anxious about being cooped up in your house for God knows how long? God knows how long. You anxious about that? It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Not thanksgiving for your circumstances, thanksgiving within your circumstances because he's in control. He's got all authority. Yes. It says, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, this is the promise now, and the peace of God then, which surpasses our understanding. You ever see somebody in the midst of chaos walk in peace? It surpasses your understanding. That peace will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is a beautiful promise that we have been given, that all authority in heaven and earth belongs to him. And so let me ask you this. I want to move into a time of reflection just for a few minutes. I want you to reflect on that word right now, that all authority belongs to him. And I want you to ask this question, where am I not believing that? Where am I struggling to believe that God is in control? Is it in your health? Is it in death? Is it in your future? Is it in your finances? 
Are you not trusting God that he's authoritative? God will use all things for good for those who love him and who are called according to his purposes. And if you love him and you're called according to his purposes, then you can say right now you are walking in good times. And that is a good word. So what I want us to do now is I just want to have a few minutes of reflection. We're going to have a countdown on the screen and we're going to be led in worship by our good friends at the Austin Stone, who's a partner church of ours. And those people know us personally. Some of them have been to our church before. I've been to their church. Many of your leaders have been to their church. They're good friends of ours. We're going to let them lead us in worship and a time of reflection. And so as we have this countdown on the screen right now, I just want you to ask this question. Where am I struggling to trust Jesus and his authority? Is it in my home with my kids? Is it in my finances? Is it in my health? Is it in my future? But just spend a few minutes. If you got to grab a pen and paper and write some of this down, that's great. Journal, pray, spend a few minutes right now just reflecting on this word. God, I look to you, I won't be overwhelmed, give me vision to see things like you do, God, I look to you, you're where my help comes from, give me wisdom, you know just what to do.
all my days I will love you God and hallelujah our God reigns hallelujah our God Hey, I really hoped you enjoyed that time, that time of reflection and thinking and processing. Just, I mean, it's always good to take an internal look. What I want us to do now is we're going to kind of transition our worship uh, to look a little bit different, but yet still be the same, right? We're continuing to worship the Lord. And one of the ways that we worship as the body of Christ is we worship through our generosity. And so I was reading recently in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, where, where Paul is beginning to kind of highlight this specific church that gave out of their poverty. He says, we want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed into a wealth of generosity on their part, for they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. And so what I want us to do is I want to just free us, right, from the temptation to feel like because of the craziness around us, we don't have to continue to operate with generous hearts, right? We are people who want to continue to see the kingdom of God advance and be reminded, like we are being reminded in this season, that our hope is not in our money. And so one of the ways that we do this is is uh, we, we give generously to the local church. And so if you have a, a phone on you, I want you to take the moment right now to be able to just text to give. And the, on the screen, our phone number will be on there and you can give there. If you already give online, praise God for that. If you not downloaded our app, download our app. There's an opportunity to give there. But, but listen, let's be a people that in the midst of chaos continue to walk in the same godliness we walked in when we felt like we were walking in the abundance of God's blessing. Okay, let's not let our external circumstances change the generosity that has absolutely made our church thrive. So let's continue to be the people that God has called us to be. We're now entering into a time of prayer, and I don't want to over 
complicate this if you're new. Prayer simply means to talk to God. You know, it's a conversation between us and Him. The beautiful thing is not is that prayer is not a monologue, it's, it's a dialogue. We speak to Him and we believe that He talks back to us through His Spirit that is in us, through His Word. So what I would love to do in the next few minutes is to pray with you. During times like this is our response as sons and daughters to pray, to cry out to the one who has the answers that we don't. Another thing that is beautiful about prayer is that prayer gives us the ability to recenter ourselves around the truth, about the truth about who we are, and most importantly, the truth about who God is. So um, right now, I just, I just wanna lead you um, to Psalm 121, and we're gonna, I'm gonna pray the Bible. Every time that we pray the Bible, we grow in the knowledge of who He is through His Word. And that brings hope to our hearts, that encourages us, that brings faith into our hearts. And in Psalm 121 it says, I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the Maker of heaven and earth. So I just want to open us up in prayer. Then we're going to have a countdown on the screen and I want you to continue to pray uh, through the scripture. We're going to have Psalm 121 on the screen, but I'm just going to open us up and then you do, uh, you continue to pray with the ones that you, uh, with the people that you are right now. So let's pray. God, I just, I just thank you so much because we, um, right now we have the ability to lift our eyes up and not be focused on the things that are happening right here around us right now we can lift our eyes up and and know that our hope comes from you lord to know that our rescue comes from you that is such a such a beautiful truth and we hold on to that lord Lord, you're the maker of heaven and earth, and we call upon you during these difficult times. We know you have the answers that we don't, and we just trust in you, Lord. We wanna put our trust in you one more time. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will lead us to find this uh, supernatural hope, this peace that surpasses understanding in Jesus Christ. And I pray that as we uh, collectively pray together, I pray that you would lead us, Lord, to pray the prayers that are in your heart for this very moment in history. We love you so much, Lord. We love you and we pray these things in your name.
Thank you so much for joining us at Netcast Home. We just want to challenge you. If you're not in a group, get in one. Now's the time to go all in with groups. With all this social distancing and craziness, now more than ever, we need to be connected. Yes, it looks different. Yes, we're not gathering like we normally do. But I would just challenge you right now, go to the App Store and download the Netcast Church app. Also, you can email groups at netcastchurch.org and we will connect you to a group leader so that you can stay up and connected with our church and with other people. Also, I just want to say on social media, follow us, YouTube, follow us, because we consistently want to send out more content, more ways to make much of the name of Jesus and connect people to the church. So thank you again for joining us and I hope you have a great week.